book of Revelation again. Chapter number 18, we see the aftermath of her being destroyed. It says in verse number 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now let's stop there. An angel flies out of heaven bringing good news. It ought to be joyous news. From everything that we read about this woman, what did she do? She put people into captivity so that she could be elevated. Right? She destroyed others. She made herself rich off of others. She took the power of others all to magnify herself. Right? That is the mentality of the world. It's the mentality of the flesh. To tear others down and to put yourself on the pedestal. That ought to be good news that she's fallen. Ought to be even better news that she has fallen... Notice he says it twice. Is fallen, is fallen. He's not just saying that the structures were torn down. He's talking about a spiritual falling away that happened before, which resulted in the destruction that we read about in the chapter before this. Notice it says, is fallen and is become the habitation of devils. It says, in the hold of every foul spirit, in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Something that on the outside, to borrow what Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees, they were whited sepulchers. What was on the inside? Dead men's bones. They looked nice and pretty on the outside. They were cisterns that could hold no water. Right, she made herself up to be, what, the greatest thing that ever was. But when you get a peek behind the curtain, it's full of demonic ideologies, demonic and beliefs. Rebellion is as what? The sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is the embodiment of rebelling against God's order and trying to substitute it with your own. Right, Every false religion... Right by definition, is some sort of witchcraft, because if you deny what this says, you're against God. It all stems from that those demonic ideologies. Well, after she's destroyed, what happens? The skeletons come out of the closet, and the angels saying, "Oh no, it's a good thing that she's fallen, because now you." What manner? <laughs> become the habitation of devils. The ones that moved in, they were the ones that were pulling the strings. I don't have time to get into all that today, but in the hold of every foul spirit, it may not be demonic, but it certainly ain't good for you if it's foul. Right? You ever been around somebody that has a foul spirit? I'm not talking about in a bad mood. I'm talking about something ain't right on the inside. Right, like something, you can see it in their eyes. You can hear it in their voice. Right, it's not that they don't just, it's not that they just don't know the Lord. It's that they have no desire to and they've already made up their mind on something else. That their conscience has been seen. They got a spirit that comes from what? The depths of hell. Well, it says, in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That one, they live there. And two, if you put a bird in a cage, you got to feed it. You got to take care of it. She was nursing the very birds. Right? Let's go through the Bible and just for a few instances here. Let's look at what birds represent. Well, let's go back to Noah on the ark. Right? The raven, right? The meat eater, the one that was disobedient. Right? Later on, God would call that an unclean bird. 
Why? Because it ate other flesh. Right? She's keeping those birds that what? Like to destroy other things that are living. But yet the dove, which was a symbol of what? Hope. Came back. If you will. Right? Dare I remind you what the visage or the appearance of the Holy Ghost anointing Christ as he was baptized what it looked like looked as a dove coming out of heaven what hope and what did he land on what did he bring he brought the true vine right? we can look at birds all throughout the, some of them were designated as certain types of sacrifices right clean animals what bring you closer to God clean animals right those things that if you implement them in your life they draw you closer to God but yet it says here, every unclean and what? Hateful bird. I don't know about you guys. I can't remember what grade I was in, but one time we had a bird. I thought it was a woodpecker. They said woodpeckers don't live around here. I don't believe them because I heard Woody the woodpecker outside of the window. Okay. But every time a teacher would go to start giving a lecture for like three weeks, Woodpecker, right? I think every, she'd stop talking, woodpecker stop. Right? It was just hateful. It wasn't hungry only when she talked. Right? But that's not the hateful kind of bird that we're talking about here. It's talking about a bird, if you were to mess with their nest or get too close to their young. Right? You take a certain path, you don't even have to get to the nest. A hawk's going to come down out of the air and attack you from where you can't see it. It's filled with rage and protective instinct. Right? Hateful birds aren't there just to annoy you. Hateful birds are there to do damage to you. Right? Anybody ever have an ostrich get angry at them? I don't think so. Because if an ostrich kicks you, you die. Like that's literally what happens. Its toes are so sharp. They kill lions out in the wilderness. You say, how's that happen? It's a big, dumb bird that can't fly. Yeah, but don't make it angry. Right? Don't make a horse angry either. Things pursue you. Hateful things are your enemy. And because it's a bird, where does it make its attack from? From the sky where you can't see. Out of trees where it's camouflaged. Right? It comes from places that you can't go to attack you and then come back for another lap. What do those birds sound like? Well, they sound like barbs or fiery darts of the devil. Where do they come from? A place that you can't go from the depths of hell. But yet here she is. She's keeping them. She's trying to make them stronger. She's trying to get them to reproduce and become more multiplied. All these things had a home inside of Babylon the great. Then in verse number three it says, For all nations. Now what does the word all mean? It means all. Every last one. It says, All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Meaning what? Everybody was tainted by this. Doesn't mean that all of them bought into it, hook, line, and sinker, but all of them at least had a taste. They had a taste of her rising, and then it says here that all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Why did God pour out that wrath upon her? Because of her fornication and her, one, corruption of God's word, corruption of the gospel, but then also corrupted the world by what? Getting them to believe a lie and in killing those that knew the truth. It says all nations are partakers of that, which means all nations are also a partaker of the wrath that God poured out upon them. Right? You don't get to be a conspirator with a bunch of criminals and then get away from all the consequences because you didn't do it. What are they guilty of? Why do they have to drink some of this? Because they were conspirators. Or conspirators. They aided and abetted. Right? 
But it says, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. She wouldn't have been able to have the fruits of her labor if didn't give her power in the first place. Remember, she had no power. It was given unto her, swindled, if you were, will, from the kings of the world. It says, And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. But she had an appetite for the fine things in life. There's a whole lot of people that line their pockets because they figured out how to make what it is that Babylon the Great wanted to buy. But those people got to be partakers too. Not just of what she did, but also the wrath. It says, And I heard a voice come from heaven, in verse number 4, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Who's he talking to here? Well, he's talking to the 144,000. Well, partaker of all this wrath. You know how God takes that woman, not Babylon the Great, the woman being his bride, Jehovah's bride, God's chosen people, right? Shields are out in the wilderness. Just come out. That you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Now that's just not that's not just true for the times. Right? Don't have anything to do with anything that Babylon the Great valued, even today. Don't associate with them. Right? Don't become a partaker of what they're doing. There's no good that comes of it. You may not be able to see into the closet. You may not be able to see everything that's really going on behind the scenes now, but God already pulled the veil back for you and showed you what's in there. It's the habitation of devils. Right? You don't want anything to do with it. Flee from it. But it says, verse number 5, For her sins have reached unto heaven. Now that is a very unique phrase in the Bible. God's angry with the wicked every day. Hey, it's only because of God's love and long-suffering that His anger and His righteous indignation does not result in Him pouring out His wrath upon the world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God daily has to choose not to destroy everything off the face of the earth. Because it is an affront to His holiness that sin exists on the earth. That something which He made perfect was corrupted by His creation. Every day we live on the grace of God. Right? That's just true statement but see for sin to become so sinful God knows about all sin that man has created he's keeping a record of it but for that sin to become so awful so repugnant to God that the sin of it makes its way all the way up to God's throne in heaven that, that's some evil. I don't know chapter and verse on this. But I do believe that might be why Sodom and Gomorrah was wiped off of the map. Because God was tired of smelling the scent that came out of their sins. And as a reminder to everyone else that he's still God, what happened? Fire and brimstone came out of heaven. Wiped them off the map. Why? Because God couldn't take the smell anymore. It was the scent of something that he knew would never repent. What does the scent of true sin smell like? It smells like a lack of remorse. It smells like conviction, meaning that they believe they're right. It smells like rebellion. It smells like a lot of that Lucifer embodied when he went to go usurp the throne of God God couldn't stand that smell when the very angel of music the minister of music in heaven put it off what did he do he got rid of it out of heaven 
Is it any wonder that once that scent makes its way back up to heaven again, that God has to deal with it? That He can no longer contain His wrath? He could. But He chooses to what? Eliminate it. It says, God hath remembered her iniquities. Every time He takes a note, until one day, He says, now the stench of that sin made it all the way to heaven. You've got to be pretty sinful to leave a smell in an all-holy place without ever going there. You guys ever been around somebody who puts on like that $2 cologne in the bathroom at a gas station? You can smell that dude from three miles away, and it's not a good smell. If he hangs around you, you can smell him after he's already left. Right? You've got to like get a steam cleaner through everything that he touched to even have a chance of getting it out of there. Well, what's God saying here? To get rid of that smell, when it gets to a certain point, only God can remove it and it has to be done with His wrath. God remembered all of her iniquity. It says, verse number 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you. And double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. In other words, what's God's repayment plan to Babylon the Great? Well, you remember that cup that she had right, was filled with the blood of the saints and she had made herself drunk off of the blood of the saints. God said, everything she did, double it and give it back to her. All the destruction and death that she called, double will be rendered unto her. All the robberies she committed will be doubly committed unto her. But every single thing that she did, twice will be repaid unto her. She thought she got away with it. Go back and read the last year. She thought she was a queen. She made herself the most and alluring thing in all of the world. And in the end, they killed the one he wanted to take. That was Babylon. It was something special, but all that she had done, God had recorded it, and he's given back double wrath for all the iniquities that she had committed. Verse number 7, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. In other words, all the elegance, all the all the high life society that she thought she was living, he says, tear it all down, and he says, instead give her torment and sorrow. She may have been able to deceive the world, but she can't escape what? Reaping what she had sown. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And to prove that he is not mocked, his judgment is just and righteous and holy with God's judgment it says verse number 7 halfway through for she saith in her heart I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see in other words what she's saying is there's always going to be another king for me to hitch my cart to I'm not a widow that's helpless no, it doesn't matter what new upstart comes along. I can sweet talk him. I can get him to do all of my dirty work for me. She says, I'm a queen. I don't need a king. Right? I can buy him. You don't think that's happened throughout the years? That false religions have been lying in the pockets of people with power? She's saying, I can give them those delicious things that I've heaped unto myself. Right? All that scarlet and purple and the pearls and everything else that she was adorned with. She says, that doesn't mean anything to me. I just want to be the real ruler, the queen, with the king as the mouthpiece. She says, I'm a queen. I'm no widow. And then it says, and shall see no sorrow. She says, I'll always find somebody to keep making me happy. And as long as she's happy, everybody else gets a little gold star 
from Babylon the Great that says you're doing a great job today and then for a while that makes them happy and when they get fed up with her what she does she goes finds another she's shameless in her pursuit of what power verse number 8 they shall therefore shall her plagues come in one day and one day these plagues will be poured out from heaven upon her death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment saying alas alas that great city Babylon the mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her and buyeth their merchandise any more the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And one day shall be utterly destroyed and do I need to remind you okay Verse number 4, I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, be not partakers. Right? Verse number 2, Angel came out of heaven. Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen and become the habitation of the Hey, she's, she's done. That ought to be celebratory news. But instead, the kings of the earth who gave power unto her, they realized that really they hitched their cart to her horse. And now they got nothing out of it. They wonder how in one day all of their best laid plans could go to waste. All the future plans that they had. Notice it says the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her. You know what that means? That they're grieved with sorrow so much that they go into mourning that they can't move on until they process what has happened. Kings won't be able to continue. Why do you think the Antichrist comes along and kills all of them for being in bed with the woman and then sets up his own government with his own ten kings? It's because these were hitched to the losing horse. So they get rid of them. They see her destruction and they realize that all the good things that they sold their soul for, all those delicious things, as the Bible calls them, those finer things in this world, all of them disappeared with her. Because all of those things were a product of what? Her actions. They were stolen, they were taken, they were deceived away from people, and they get destroyed with her. And all the kings of the world that are used to being fed with a silver spoon buyer, they realize that their lifestyle is over. It says, and they lament her destruction. It says, when they shall see the smoke of her burning. It's going to be inescapable. It's going to be like a giant bonfire. A pillar of smoke coming up through the air. But I'm sure that you could have seen from afar off the aftermath of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah too. Seen that or the rain of fire come down out of heaven perhaps. I don't think that seeing God's judgment and God's wrath is what turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. She disobeyed God. That's what turned her into a pillar of salt. But I can promise you one thing, if you ever saw his wrath poured out upon this earth, you'd never forget it. And these men have seen her destruction and the smoke coming up, and they realize that all their hopes and dreams are in those smoke, or in that smoke and in the ashes floating through the air. 
Then it says, verse number 11, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. They're heartbroken too. Are they saying, oh, she was such a great woman. She did so much good in the community. No. They're merchants. They weep and mourn over her because no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. They built a life off of catering to her, to again, to quote the Bible, delicious appetites. Those things that were specific to her. What I find delicious is different than what you find delicious. We all got different preferences. Right? They say that about every six years, your taste buds, all the old ones are gone, and you've replaced them already, and that's why food that you used to like tastes different now. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say. That's why those things that you used to like as a kid, now you can't stand them. Her appetites are so specific to her that these merchants can't go out and make a living. Other people. Other people find no value in them. Other people, they don't want things that look like her. They want things that look like them. More specifically, in the tribulation, they'll want things that look like the Antichrist, the beast. They'll want things that identify with him, not with things that look like that woman, Mystery Babylon. They won't want things that remind them of the former. They want to look forward to the new one. Why are these guys mourning? Because they're going broke. Has nothing to do with that woman. Has to do with themselves. Then we get a list of all the things that you used to buy up. Right, what is it a list of? Well, in Bible days, these are a list of the creme de la creme, the best of the best that you could get. It says, verse number 13 at the end, uh, it says, and chariots, those are instruments of war, and slaves, and souls of men. Here in this verse, the Bible says that there are people that sell other people out to Babylon the Great because they get rich off of it. Now again, we've told you Babylon the Great is the all-encompassing idea, the closest before the Antichrist came to the full power of Antichrist in this world. With a goal of trying to reunite the entire world against God's people. The okay, devil almost got it one time where the thoughts of men were evil continually. Except for one, his name was Noah. He found grace in the eyes of God. So God put Noah on a boat. Well, this time the boat comes along and it's not Noah, it's the church. And he takes us out of here. And what's he do? He judges the world who's, you know, what does the Bible say about the, the rapture? It'll take place in a time where it was as the days of Noah because of the similarities. Well, who's left at that point? Well, if you take the church out of here, all you have is false idols and false ideologies and false religions all trying to compete what was the mentality of Babylon the Great if you'll remember when we talked about it before I'll take this part of your religion that part of your religion this part of your religion and we can all be happy under one umbrella Right? use whatever book you want to read out of it just say that you believe these things and sign this paper and you can be a part of our club but you got to do what that lady says Well, some people along the way have found out that they can make a little bit of change by going out and telling people that they should go listen to that woman. doesn't say that these merchants were partakers of what she did. They just knew that she had some cravings, and she kept, they kept feeding her. Right? It doesn't take somebody with all that much brain power to realize if somebody wants something and you can go get it you can sell them those things and make money off of it and she's got a big appetite but when the Bible talks about gainsayers some of them aren't fleecing the people that they're talking to some people will go and talk to people and not ask them for a thing 
They're being paid by Babylon the Great. And what are they dealing in? The very souls of mankind. Making people twofold the child of hell. It says that they also sell their slaves. Not all slaves wear shackles. Not all people that are enslaved that were taken away from their home, bought and purchased by somebody else, and then moved to a different location. That form of slavery still exists in the world today, believe it or not. But the slavery we're talking about here is mental, emotional slavery. Yes, Babylon the Great throughout all the years has owned literal slaves. But nowadays she's got people that don't think without asking her, don't speak without consulting with her. What are they? They're just drones. They're mouthpiece. They have no free will. They do what somebody else tells them to do because they believe it's the right thing to do. Don't fault them for thinking it's the right thing to do. You didn't know any better until you got saved. But they become slaves to an ideology. Go and study and look at some of the things that other religions require of you. Right? Mandatory. Not voluntary. You've got to do it. And if you don't, they kick you out. Best case scenario. Other places, they not only kick you out of the church, you get kicked out of the city. You get kicked out of any city that they're incorporated in. You get blacklisted from all of their society. Sounds like slavery. They tell you you're free, but nope, you got to do all these things. Doesn't sound like Christ, because if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. I'm no, under, no, no longer under the bondage of the law. He broke my shackles. That, he set me free. But yet she deals in what market? The slave trade. She shackles people every day. And there are people who made themselves very wealthy off of introducing people to her whether they're a partaker with her or not. But then, verse number 14, it says, And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For on one hour so great riches has come to naught. The merchants see thing that they had stockpiled, that they had sold to her. It's all gone in an instant. Somebody owes you something. if they didn't pay you for it. Right, or you can go to a, a state auction and get things dirt cheap because people don't know what they are. Not the case here. What's it say? It says, All the fruits right, are departed from thee. All the things which are daintly and goodly are departed from thee. Thou shalt find them no more. They're gone. Then the merchants stand afar off. Why? Because of the fear of her torment, weeping, and wailing. It's clear to everybody that this isn't an enjoyable experience for Babylon the Great. Weeping and wailing, you know what that sounds like? It sounds like hell. Where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and the worm dies not. She's literally experiencing what? Hell on earth, God's judgment. That's what hell was designed for. To enact God's judgment upon supernatural beings for their obedience. But verse number eight or verse number nineteen. Nah, back up seventeen. We forgot the shippers. It says, For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ship and as many as trade by sea when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? 
And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Even the shippers, because in order to get things from A to B, you got to pay somebody to take it there. Unless you want but they need to buy all the stuff anyway. All the people, the trickle-down system that had any part of it. What's it say? It says that they do what in the Old Testament you were supposed to do to show repentance towards God. They throw ashes on their head, dust. Right? They go literally in the morning. Not only inwardly, outwardly saying, hey, don't mess with me. My, my whole system shook up. So many are so willing to the Antichrist economy with the mark in their hand, mark in the forehead, because they don't know how they're going to make it. They're real desperate. Half of the world's mourning. Why? Because Babylon the Great has fallen. Then in verse number 20, it says, Rejoice over her, thou heavens, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. But from heaven's point of view, what the world sees is some horrible tragedy. What God sees is someone's just desert. Heaven rejoices because after all, after so many years of those that were martyred, right? who's it say? It says rejoice, apostles and prophets. God hath avenged you on her. After so long of knowing that God was going to take care of it, he turns and says, we took care of it. And they know that he took care of it well. They're having a, what? Shouting party in heaven. Rejoice, the one that defiled so many, the one that tempted so many, the one that polluted so many, the one that literally massacred so many. She's finally gone. Then a verse and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great mill and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Millstone, by the way, was a stone big enough that they could throw all the granary or all the grapes into one machine and they could wheel that thing around it. And it would have to be so heavy that absolutely pulverize anything that they put underneath them. So imagine throwing that into the ocean. Right? You ever just take like a five pound weight and take it into a pool with you? Feels a whole lot heavier than five pounds real quick. Right? There's physics of that. We don't have time to get into that. But that millstone, it's going to sink real quick. But where's it going? It's not going to get stuck on a little tiny, you know, sand dune underneath of the water. No, it's going to the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean. It is a millstone. It's round. Where's it going to roll down to? The very bottom. Angel, as he throws that one into the sea, he says, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. God's not just going to wipe them off the map. No, it's going to be done in a very violent manner. Why? Because that's how she treated the apostles, the prophets, and the people of God with violence. And it'll happen suddenly, and before you know it, it'll be over, and you can't see what happened. Just like throwing a stone into a pond, you know there's a ripple, but very soon those ripples disperse. I mean, you can't go back if I pinpoint this is exactly where it, where it happened or what happened. It's going to come swift. It's going to come by. Verse number 22, The voice of the harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And whatsoever crafty be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone 
shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. What's it say? No more record. No one will remember. You can't find anything that brings praise to her because God's wrath will be swift and it'll be total. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.